All right, everyone. Well, thank you for joining tonight as we begin a brand this, Excuse me. Yep. I'm raising my hand. I don't know how to raise my hand. I have just had a message pop up that says this meeting is being recorded. Yep. And I've been hacked recently. Is this supposed to be recorded? Yep, I'm recording. I'm going to go okay. ahead and throw it on YouTube uh, whenever I'm done. So we should be in a good place. Um, and then that way, if anybody misses, there are a couple of ladies that are normally involved. They'll come by later. And uh, if you're checking it out over uh, the next couple of days, you know who you are. So uh, I understand. OK, very good. I'll, excuse me for interrupting, but it's going to happen again, I guarantee. <laughs> All good. All good. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, good. everyone, thanks for joining. We're starting tonight with Nehemiah, Kingdom Builder and Visionary. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to learn some leadership lessons as we go throughout. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. Um Today is September 11th, and, uh, you know, it's been actually, I think I heard, 23 years since the days uh, that we know of those first few days of September 11th and what that all means. And so it's very easy to forget, but it is a very important day. Um, thousands of people lost loved ones um, and, uh, you know, lost their lives. So we want to remember them. I'm going to hold them up in prayer and pray that the Lord would be with us tonight as we join together around God's word. And uh, it just reminds us uh, on this difficult day in that way, it reminds us that this world is in our home, that we're passing through, that we're not guaranteed tomorrow, uh, much less our next breath even. But um, knowing that we're ready and knowing that the Lord has prepared a place for us uh, we face life with a different kind of strength and energy and confidence. And uh, so uh, our hearts go out to those folks. But at the same time, um, we definitely uh, do take take joy in knowing that uh, so many of them are, are still there in heaven and waiting for their families to reunite. So let's pray and uh, we'll get started. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for this day. And uh, we know that this is a difficult day in history. Uh, that this day is one that brings pride uh, in our country, but yet at the same time, much sorrow. And so I just pray that you would continue to keep us safe, watch over us, guide our paths. But Lord, when those things that uh, happen in our world remind us that this world is not built for us to live here forever, we know that we have a forever home with you. And so we just want to be mindful of those who are hurting uh, those whose lives have been changed by not only September 11th, but also the war that followed. And I just pray that you would bring healing and uh, peace and comfort to those people today. And Lord, as we open your word, we would be touched by the eternal and may it give us strength for the here and now. And we pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Well, <clears throat> so off we go. And I have no idea what you guys' uh, mindset is on Nehemiah, but we're going to be talk, uh, talking about Nehemiah over the next seven weeks. And I just want to kind of give you a quick update and just a reminder of some of the places that we've been. Some of these things you will probably see on your screen, you might remember. Uh, this was our last uh, teaching that we had, the Psalms of David, as we're going through a David teaching series on our Sunday mornings. We also recently finished the parables. We've gone into Galatians study by study, verse by verse, restored, talking about the book of Ezra and how there was a restoration. We've been with Gideon. We've talked about Paul's pastoral letters, the book of Ruth. We've gone through the book of Acts. We've gone through Colossians. We've gone through David. We've dove deep on the wise men around Christmas time. We've been through Ephesians. We've been through Jonah, Revelation, Philippians, and the real Christmas story, and even more. So I guess what I'm saying is these are the places that we've been, we've tried, and hopefully you notice there that there's Old and New Testament that's on purpose. Um, <clears throat> I want to make sure that you guys are familiar with this God's word from front to back and uh, back to front. But I also want to just encourage you when you guys are putting uh, time in, you're learning God's word. We go back and we look at some of those things. And man, I, I remember as I was compiling these slides and just kind of going through the different ones, I remember so many things 
from these books and remember them deeper than I remembered them before. And uh, I've gone to Bible college for goodness sakes, you know, so we're still learning. We're learning from one another um, and we're going deep in God's word. And I just want to encourage you, keep going because we'll cover more. And soon there'll be four more slides uh, about where we've been, what we're going to go through and what we're going to learn. So thanks for being a part. And we're talking about Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah. And here's where we're going to go tonight. <clears throat> we're going to talk about the who, what, when, where, and why of Nehemiah, then talk quickly about the empires. And then I'm going to get to you guys and your insights. So hopefully a couple of you guys took the time to do the pre-reading in Nehemiah chapter one. We'll do a deep dive on that. Then we'll talk about the leadership lessons, and that is the key characteristic of Nehemiah. If you really know the book of Nehemiah, you know this. There's a leadership lesson everywhere you look in Nehemiah. And so as we go through this uh, study, there's a, a number uh, of different chapters, but we're going to be consolidating some. Chapter one is on its own. Chapter two next week will be on its own. But each and every time we have a lesson, we'll come away with at least, at least one leadership lesson from the things that we've studied, but oftentimes more. Tonight, there's three and uh, some very, very important ones. So we're going to learn how to lead. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, Randy, I mean, I'm not a leader. Let me just tell you, I believe with all of my heart that we are all leaders. It's just a question of to who, right? Um, if you have kids, you're a leader. I, you can say, I don't want to be a leader, but the truth of the matter is, is that they look up to you and look to you as a leader. And so at work, um, in church, uh, at home, um, in your family, in your extended family, whatever it may be, uh, even in your community, you are a leader in some area of your life, whether that's a few people or numbers of people. Let's do it right and let's do it God's way. And we can learn from God's word for sure. So here's where we're starting yeah, off and yeah. why of Nehemiah. <clears throat> so if you see here, John, did you say something there, buddy? I'm sorry. I was trying nope. to unmute it. Nope. Um, nothing. Nope. No, go ahead. Proceed, please. All good. Um, I uh, we're just going to say here these first few verses, and I'm going to read these. Teresa, I promise I haven't replaced you. You are definitely still the, the gal who wants who I want to do the reading, but I'm going to read these quickly and let's just talk about what do we see in Nehemiah chapter one about the who, what, when, where, and why of this book. So real quickly, here's the first three or four uh, verses. As you see it here, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa, the citadel that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So if you look real closely at those things that are said there, and the things that I underlined, you can see some of the things that we can recognize right away about Nehemiah. First of all, Nehemiah is an exiled Jew. He called Hakaliah or uh, his uh, brothers who had come from Judah and Judea. He is in exile himself. That means he is a prisoner or a slave who has been taken away from a, a conquered military situation. He is living in the citadel of Susa, it said. And so we know that Susa was the capital of the Persian Empire, which began reigning about 550 and reigned until about 330. So we know basically the time frame of the book when it was written. Are you guys all following along with me? There's a lot of little clues here that as you read through it, you don't necessarily recognize it right away. But then here it says Jerusalem's walls are in ruin. And so we see here right away, we've got the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why of what's going on in this book. We're going to go a little deeper, but that's what we see right from the start. Okay, so let's talk very quickly about the empires of the Bible, because the Bible is not in chronological order. And I've talked about this a, a hundred different times, but this is very, very important because what you see when you see the book of Nehemiah 
in there close to Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, you may think they're about the same time frame when the truth is, is that one is at the kind of the earlier part of the Old Testament, and then one is at the very latest part of the Old Testament, but they're put there together because they're books of history. And so just like, no offense, Shelley, sometimes the library system does not really make sense as to where they're going to put a book on a shelf. I know it makes perfect sense to my wife. Um, she paid for that degree, so it better. Uh, but ultimately, like for me, it doesn't always make sense. In the Jewish Bible, they were more topical than they were chronological. And let's be very clear. That makes a lot of sense if you're a, a, a bunch of people who don't own one of these right? If you don't own a watch, chronology is not nearly the precise science that it is. And also, let's be very clear, if you don't have a TV and if you don't read, then it's very, very difficult to do chronology in the same way that we do almost automatically in modern times. You guys with me? Y'all understand what I'm saying? So we don't want to just, oh my goodness, I am, what in the world is going on on my background? Did y'all see that? I was, I was clearly a snowflake there for a, a brief moment. Um, I just needed to let it go. Let it go. Okay. Somebody laughed. I, at least I, I hope that's what I want to interpret it. Did any of you guys catch my little frozen reference there? Or was it just those of us who have daughters? Anyway, there we go. So the empires of the Bible, they come and they go and they ebb and they flow. And, and that all happens kind of without any preamble. And so I want to just be clear that there are times in the Bible where if you can recognize some of these empires, it kind of gives you a hint as to what's going on and where it's falling in the um, actual timeline of life. Uh, so real quickly, the Egyptian empire, we know this one about Moses, right? Let my people go. They're going to leave Egypt. They're going to go out of the Red Sea, right? The Egyptian empire begins about 3000 BC. And that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. All of these are all kind of right there in that one era. The Assyrian empire begins in about 1000 to 610. That's Kings, that's Chronicles. That's the prophet Isaiah. Right in here, just before the Assyrian Empire ascends, you have King David, King Saul, and King Solomon. You guys understand? So again, it just kind of, it happens, and it's not really identifying chronologically. The Babylonian Empire is when they came in and took the Hebrew, the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and their guy, Daniel who was also in that crew, right? And so that's all happening. They are taken about this time, about 586, and we'll get to, to a timeline in just a minute. That prophet was Jeremiah. Um, the Medo-Persian Empire, whose capital is in Susa, that's Ezra, that's Nehemiah, that's Esther, right? And so all of this stuff is going on. You have the Greek empire that happens between the end of the Old Testament and before the beginning of the New Testament. So this entire empire comes on the scene with Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world in 333 BC. And basically from that time, about 330 to 30 BC is the reign of the Greek empire, then replaced by the Roman empire, which began. And so as the New Testament opens, they're just automatically a different empire that's reigning, and it's the Roman Empire in that situation. You guys following along? I, I hope this makes some sense, because if you can start to get a little bit of a grasp on it, and it all begins with repetition, but also just understanding here, when that, that stuff kind of starts hitting, it starts to make a little bit more sense and you can place yourself in history. And you can see some of these ancient artifacts. This is the Persian Empire. This is one of the telltale uh, images of the Persian Empire um, with the bearded, uh, the curly beard and the curly hair um, and these uh, individuals. So, all right, any questions, thoughts or comments real quick before I kind of go a little further and a little deeper on the Persian Empire, anyone? Okay, I'm going to mute Leroy there for a moment. Well, here's where I would like to begin. 
with the Persian Empire here, you see, do you guys recognize this particular peninsula here? The Saudi Arabian Peninsula? Anybody recognize this country right here? Ah, I got a smile out of that, right? Kirthi's smiling because she is literally from India. This is India. So if this gives you an indication from India up into, I'm guessing this is Pakistan and maybe Nepal and in these areas, maybe even a touch of China involved. You've got Iran, Iraq, probably Kuwait, uh, right over here at the edge. I believe you got what is modern day UAE um, up here into uh, Israel, uh, Lebanon, over here into Iran, Iraq, and all the way over to the edge of Greece. This is a huge empire, and this is the one that was one of the largest of the empires up to that point. And so as we see that, that is what's happening. Now, real quickly, do you guys remember that I told you that Judges was once a part of, the, that Ruth was a book, part of the book of Judges? It was all one book. Ezra and Nehemiah were actually one book because they were covering the same time frame and the same material and the same situation of restoring Jerusalem after the exiles had been taken away, taken captive, and there were nobody there was nobody there basically who was Jewish that was left over. And so the theme and the time frame is similar in Ezra and Nehemiah so that initially they were just one book just like Judges and Ruth were all one book at one time, eventually split up, um, you know, into two books. And if you remember, we talked about Ezra and how it was all about restoring the nation and beginning again Jerusalem, bringing it out of the ashes, so to speak. So I want to revisit that. And then in just a moment, I'm going to give you guys a chance to talk a little bit about what you heard in Nehemiah chapter 1. And then we'll go deep. So check this out. Here's a little bit of a timeline of the Old Testament. It's not complete. It's not every single thing. But notice here, you guys remember we talked about how there is a separation of the kingdom, right? Um, where there is the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. And that happens after Saul, David, Solomon. And then he has a son who reigns over the southern kingdom named Rehoboam. And then there's a man named Jeroboam that reigns over the northern kingdom. And they basically kind of separate into two different nations instead of just one. That happens in 930 BC. And then you see there's different ones that come onto the scene. The ministry of Jonah was here about 800 to 780 BC. The fall of Samaria, the kingdom of the north, uh, 721. And then here's the one that we recognize. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all of their family members taken off to Babylon in the fall of Jerusalem. And Israel goes into exile, which had been predicted by Jeremiah the prophet for 70 years. Do you guys remember who built the first temple? The first temple was built not by David, but by who? Do you remember? Solomon. Very good. Very good. That's right. So Solomon's temple was the first. Zerubbabel's temple in Ezra is that second one. And then you see here at the end, 430 BC approximately is the close of the new of the Old Testament. And then 430 silent years into the New Testament. Now, I'm giving you a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff here. Let me just kind of share this with you real quickly. Let's go a close up on that exile. The Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go off to Babylon, Babylon, the Babylonian kingdom. But in the midst of it all, Babylon is conquered by the Medio Persian Empire. You see, the Bible kind of gives us pieces and parts of redemptive history, but human history is rolling along. And so this one empire that affected Jerusalem so significantly by exiling them, taking them out of Jerusalem, laying waste to the city, it all happens and they go away at about 585, 586. But then when that all happens, all of that 
doesn't stop the other reigns that are going on. And the Medio Persian Empire comes in, snatches all of those captives away, and makes them their captives now in their capital city. And all of this happens, but they've got a different viewpoint of how to treat prisoners of war. Instead of keeping them here, keeping them under our thumb, we're going to send them back to where they want to live anyway, but they're going to pay us ridiculous amounts of tribute, and they're going to be our vassals. They're going to be our, our uh, subjects, basically, right? And so that is their way. And so in the process of it all, the Jews get to go back to Jerusalem, but they still pay tribute back to Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and all of the others. So taken away from Jerusalem to Babylon, Babylon. Are you frozen? Are you frozen? Off they go to Susa. So that's oh. it. All right. Any question? Oh, let, let me show this to you real quickly. There's Jerusalem. There's Susa. Am I freezing up some? A little bit. I'm sorry about that. Um, my internet connection at home is better, but uh, it's better than the one I would have gotten on the road. <laughs> Sorry, up here doing some church business uh, up here in Dallas. So I apologize. All right. Any questions, thoughts, or comments? Anyone? Anyone? I know I just threw a ton of information at you. Um, <laughs> hopefully that is stuff that will help you. And if you're like me, visually seeing stuff like this up here where I can see the timeline and it starts to kind of make sense. That helps me personally. So I'm hopeful that it helps you. And if those of you who are looking at Kirthi and she's shaking her head like slowly like this, you need to know that in the Indian culture, this is her way of agreeing with me. And I'm not even joking. This is her way of saying yes in the Indian culture. Am I right, Kirthi? Yes. Okay. Very good. She She's backing me up. It is true. So she's not just disagreeing with me uh, with her uh, frustration. I just wanted you to know that. And, um, you know, she'll disagree with me when it's time. It's just not yet. All right. Very good. Okay. It is my turn to shut up and your turn to talk. Tell me if you read Nehemiah chapter one, what was your favorite part? What was interesting to you? What stood out? What jumped out? All of the questions that we always ask. Um, let's talk about it from your perspective, and then we'll dive a little deeper. So you can be the first on the first lesson from the first chapter of this book and of this study. So uh, that's all I got. I don't have even a really, I guess I have a gold sticker. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but anybody have a observation, thought, comment, a favorite verse from Nehemiah chapter one? Anyone? Uh, yes, I do. So I was reading um, from verse 4 to the end. And what, one thing that stood out to me was that Nehemiah took it upon himself to put himself into fasting and intercede for the, for the people. Then at the end of that chapter, there was a particular sentence that got me thinking a little bit. It says, for I was the king's cup bearer. Then I was wondering why was it not introduced at the king's court bearer at the beginning but why did he have to put it at the end and i was like okay it's it's for a particular emphasis but then while i was like thinking about it something spoke to me that that's what the holy spirit does on our behalf interceding for us and i also remember that i've heard people say um jesus christ is the um is the cup bearer then I went on Google and searched what a cup bearer means. And it means that the person that tastes the drink before giving the person that stands in place to like take all the bullets before it gets to um to the king. And that is what Jesus Christ is doing for us. Yeah. So that's what came to my mind. That's cool. I've read Nehemiah a number of times and I have never thought about that, but I love I love that uh, analogy that Jesus is the one who's mm -hmm. in the way of the bullets hitting us. He's taking our bullets for us. And uh, that is great, Monica. Very good observation for sure. Mm -hmm. Never thought of it, but love it and think it's a really good observation for sure. All right. Anyone else? 
And a cupbearer was <clears throat> someone you could you could trust. He was very trustworthy. Yes. <clears throat> Actually, I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be sharing a passage uh, out of a book called Visioneering by Andy Stanley. And it talks about how God used his trustworthiness and his integrity to put him in a place where he could do amazing things through Nehemiah's commitment. It's a beautiful thing. And um, we're going to be talking more about that this week and next week, Frank, his integrity and uh, his trustworthiness. It, it brings him into the presence of a king. It brings him honestly into a trusted role with the most powerful man on earth at that moment. Let's not miss that, okay? Like, let's not miss that. He had a daily, multiple times daily, he had an audience with the most powerful man in the entire world at that time. Now, <laughs> as a believer, that's probably a pretty good place to be, right? Doesn't mean that everything's easy, but it sure opens up a whole different set of possibilities that God will exploit in the way that only God can. And it's really cool that Nehemiah does not exploit it, but God enables it. And we'll talk more about that next week. I'm getting ahead of myself. It's a great story. Hang in here. Stay with me. Be here for that next week. Good stuff. All right. Anyone else got time for one or two more? And then we'll keep moving um, and you can come back. Anyone? Uh, uh, the pattern of Nehemiah's prayer uh, what I personally thought was like, uh, when you want to intercede for any one of your loved ones, this is exactly the right words to put in prayer. If you are, if you do not know what to pray, these are the exact words where you will honor God who he is initially and how faithful he is to his covenant. And then comes what sinful people we are including he himself will say, I am sinner along with my fathers. He says that there on behalf of Israelites. Uh, and the pattern, how it goes, if, if this is a beautiful intercessory prayer, I should say. And I have learned from that prayer how I can prioritize, how I can communicate with God in prayer when I'm interceding for my own family or for my church family and everyone just putting the right words there, God, you are, you be attentive, you listen to it. And the best part of this prayer is verses 8, 9, and 10. Those really remind who God is, who God is and who we are. We are the unfaithful ones, where God is the faithful one. He already mentioned who he is and what he's going to do in the law of Moses, where he says, if you are unfaithful, I'm going to scatter you. But he, in his patience, that scattering happened after some 3,000 years or some uh, a very long period. Yeah. He yeah. has given enough warnings to prophets, to Israel. They didn't. But the hope comes here where it says, but if you return to me in repentance, in true repentance and keep the commandments, that is his word, what he has told us. So wherever you are, I will gather you. I will bring you back where my name dwells. I think that is the hope for Christianity, yes. where Jesus said the same words. And yes. we have that hope. And I think it's also, too, in many ways, exactly what happens with Nehemiah. He goes and he prepares the place like Jesus said he's going to do for us. And then he brings the people to him in the place that he's prepared. So, again, we see like Monica was mentioning and like you're talking about that he's doing the work of God and almost the type uh, or almost the vision or view of Christ and also how Christ is our intercessor, right? How he prays on our behalf as Hebrews. Said. And I love what you said there. There is a great intercessory prayer here. And um, I want to just mention something. <clears throat> yes. Nehemiah is in the role of prisoner or slave, but he is also in the presence of the most powerful man in the world. And you can kind of choose which way you view yourself. You know, I'm in the presence of the king. I'm eating the king's food and drinking the king's wine and I'm in the king's palace. So I may as well be a king in my mind, or I am still a humble servant 
of God who needs him to intercede on our behalf. I'm not home because I'm not where God wants us, right? And so Nehemiah took the second one. When he hears about this, he's not like, doesn't affect me. I'm feeling good. I know where my meal's coming from. It's going to be from that table, and it's the best table in the entire kingdom. He's not satisfied with the things around him. He's only satisfied by the things inside him, and that's what's lacking. And so when he hears that Jerusalem is broken down, he breaks down, and he says, you know, immediately just starts pouring out his heart to God, not a guy who is satisfied to just wash his hands and move on. He is burdened. And we're going to talk more about that, but I don't know. I kind of got ahead of myself there a little bit, but um, yeah, it's great as always, always great to hear from you guys. We'll have some time. If you got one or two more, when we're reading, we're going to just keep moving now just for the sake of time. But let me just mention to you <clears throat> the Bible app.com or Bible.com app, excuse me, is one that you can get on your phone for Android or for iPhone, and it can read to you while you're driving. And uh, I highly encourage you to do this because I will tell you just flat out, and I'm sorry if I'm glitching a little bit, um, I'll tell you flat out, there's something about reading the same verse of scripture over and over and over again that you notice something different the third and fourth and fifth time. And so if I ever give a, 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 a chapter and you just want to listen to it a couple or three or four times, you might be surprised how the word starts coming alive to you, um, you know, even after you've read it. So let's go to a deeper dive. And again, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Teresa. She's excited about all the names that she's got to pronounce. I know she is. So Teresa, let me just say before you get started, however you end up pronouncing them, if I pronounce them different, you were probably right. And I'm going to tell you also that you're going to do better than anybody else here on this uh, call would have done anyway. So don't even give it a second thought. Just go for it, plow ahead, and we're with you, heart, body, and soul. All right, here we go. All right. <laughs> All right, are you there? Did I freeze? Oh, oh no. Did I freeze? Oh, goodness. I thought he was posing. <laughs> I was, I, there we go. <laughs> Sorry okay. about that. I, I'm doing the best I can. You probably saw where I'm staying here in comfort suites. So there you go. <laughs> okay. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. <clears throat> as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Okay. This is where I cut the first chapter in half. There's only about 11, 12 verses. But this is where I kind of saw a natural break. So is there anything that jumps out to you? Or is this a passage, a part of the passage that you read and thought, this is my favorite part? Anyone in there that will have something that they'd like to uh, have an observation on? Anyone? Just at verse four, where it jumps out, you know, uh, uh, as soon as he heard it, he sat down and wept and mourned. I mean, he felt for him so so deep i mean that's something that seems to be missing not only in the world or the city but in some churches yeah. kind of, we just don't i don't see the compassion yeah that was good no you're right i uh, i think i think that we can move on too fast sometimes from the pain of others and um you know, the Bible says in the New Testament that we're supposed to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice, right? Uh, so it's hard sometimes to 
do that empathizing that we really are called to do. But if you've ever had a time where your heart is broken and somebody comes and sits with you and allows their heart to be broken as well, it really is a powerful, powerful thing. Um, yeah, great, uh, great observation there, Leroy. Very good. Anyone else that I want to move on too fast, if you've got something that jumped out to you, um, I always ask the same question. So you can ask yourself this question anytime you're reading the scripture, what's jumping out to me, and then learn what God might be telling you in that moment. Anyone? <clears throat> okay. If not, that's fine. Just in the sake of time, let's keep it moving and I'll turn it back over to Teresa. Teresa, good to go. And I said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you. Against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. All right. Is there anything that jumps out to any of you there? Anyone there? <clears throat> I think, um, are you guys able to hear me? Can y'all give me a thumbs up if you're able to? Okay, very good. Um, my computer and this internet connection are giving me some up and down motions here. So I do apologize. But I noticed this <clears throat> it says, give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. If you know the story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is about to ask a huge, huge way out of the way favor. Um, I don't even know. If it, you can't even call it a favor, really. It's like, hey, I want you to appoint me to a new position and it's not good for you, but it's great for me. And I want you to pay for it and I want you to, you know, fund it and I want you to go build me a house over there. And like, he's about to ask for the sun, the moon and the stars, right? And here's what he's saying, Lord, like basically he's saying, and you guys will see more of this next week if you haven't read or don't know the story. But if you do, you know what I'm talking about. He's about to ask this huge thing that he should not even, he, he should be ashamed of himself, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to be funny. Like he should be ashamed of himself, but he is just praying. He's like, Lord, I know what needs to be done. And I know the place that I am. And that's not a coincidence. I'm going to ask for all of it. And God grants him all all of it through his, his boss, his King, but it's an amazing thing. And his faith is great. And it's just, it's, it's an amazing story that we're going to see more of, but I just noticed right off the bat here, he's before he's even done it, he's already praying, Lord, I'm going to ask for so much. It's only going to work if you're in it. And that's powerful. Um, okay. Okay. Now let's talk about, and, and the cupbearer to the king, 
that of course probably jumps out, right? Because uh, cup bearer, right? So what exactly, you knew we couldn't have a Bible study unless we visited gotquestions.org. So here we are, you know, just count it off the list, go ahead and check it off the box. What is a cup bearer? We have an answer. Historically, a cup bearer is a high ranking official in charge of serving the king. It was primarily the responsibility of a cupbearer to serve the wine to the royal table. Since king were concerned about plots to poison them, dot, 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 right? So basically the idea, if you haven't grasped it, let's just imagine that this cup is going to be drank out of by the king. Well, back in the day, they couldn't exactly tell what was poisoned and what wasn't. And it was one of the ways that you could literally take over a kingdom. If you were just anybody, but you had poison and could get it into the right cup, you might take the throne. So it's worth the risk. You guys following me? So what they did instead was they had somebody else take that cup, drink from it themselves, and then watch. Make sure that old Nehemiah didn't kill over. So I guess it's okay, right? And there would probably be some food tasting as well, but definitely the cup bearer to the king. That's not exactly a great position, but it's also a great position. Does that make sense? Right. I mean, like, you know, it, it, you could be fired suddenly, you know, um, in not the best way and not with the, you know, severance package either. So it could be a really rough job, but it was also, again, daily twice three times daily in the most prestigious place in the entire known world at that time so real quickly you can see here nehemiah was cut bearer to the persian the medial persian empire king artaxerxes loyal to the king worked with a good positive attitude um, one day nehemiah presented the wine with sadness we're going to talk about that next week the king notices and asks his cup bearer for the reasons for his sadness so as you go down here, you just notice it says Nehemiah's work as cupbearer is a good reminder to us today that God cares how we work. Whatever we do, we need to do it with all of our heart as working to the Lord, not for human masters. Nehemiah's service is a reminder to work hard, work faithful, work with a good attitude, no matter what our role is. When we work hard and show that we can be trusted, God is honored and others notice. And here's what I want to share with you. Let me ask you. When Nehemiah asks this huge thing, do you think if Nehemiah wasn't the kind of worker that the king wanted, if he would have said, sure, oh, you want more? Okay, sure. Oh, you want even more? Sure. Even more? Fine. No problem. What else do you need, right? Like if Nehemiah is not in that position and if he's not given his whole heart to that position, he doesn't accomplish what God is about to accomplish through him. And that's important to notice, right? Um, sometimes we get ourselves in a, in a situation where we forget that people recognize when we're treating our life as a calling rather than just simply a job. So that's important. All right. Questions, thoughts, or comments real quickly before we move on. All right. So I'm going to throw a few different things at you real quickly. Nehemiah's story holds something transformational for us. And then I'm going to get to these leadership lessons. Here's the hint. These two books of the Bible have a similar, similar transformational truth. In the book of Esther, you may or may not remember that teaching that God's name is not mentioned. In the entire book of Esther, in those 13 chapters, God's name is not mentioned. But the way that I said it, the way that Chuck Swindoll says it in his book on Esther, that's similar to the one that we're going through with David. He said that God's fingerprints are all over all of the events in Esther, right? I mean, from the time that he's about to be confronted uh, and, and basically the Jews as a nation are on the chopping block and he can't sleep. So he goes to the records and it's all written down. God's timing and fingerprints and providence are everywhere in the book of Esther. Here's really an important thing. Here's the transformational truth. It's from that book, Visioneering. And I want you to kind of keep in mind here 
This is the graphic that I created for Nehemiah, the kingdom builder and the visionary having to do with the walls. So let's check this out. In Andy Stanley's book, that leadership book based on Nehemiah, he points out that there is no miracle that takes place within Nehemiah's pages. Instead, it's a story of how God's plan is accomplished as one man partners with God to accomplish God's vision in that man's life and that man's situation. In other words, here's what's transformational. I think sometimes we think to ourselves, if God would show up and miraculously do something, then that would be wonderful and I'll be you know, able to do something for God in that way. Here's what Andy Stanley mentions, and this is so important. Nehemiah did something amazing for God, so much so that he's in the category of scripture, having his name on a book. He is the main character for 13 chapters of this story, and not a single miracle takes place. All it is, is just focus, determination, hard work, prayer, and fasting so he knows what God's plan is, and then just going forward in God's plan, and God shows up. I mean, don't get me wrong. His fingerprints are on that big ask that we're going to talk about next week as Nehemiah says, I need the sun and the moon and the stars. And by the way, I'm not coming back to work for you again. He's like, okay, cool. No problem. And he gives it all to him. Now that doesn't work with your boss, right? I mean, that's not how that's going to work in your situation. So God's clearly in it. But in the midst of it all, we see God there, but we also notice that Nehemiah's partnership with God is taking center stage. Let's go a little further so you can understand. God spent, this is from this visionary book. Great quote here. It's a little lengthy. Hang with me if you can. God had spent years preparing and positioning Nehemiah and Artaxerxes for what was about to unfold. So Nehemiah was noted for his integrity and his trustworthiness, and God landed him that job. They gave him an inside track to the king. As cupbearer, Nehemiah had a special relationship with the king as well. Every day, the king entrusted his life to the man who served him his wine. It was the cupbearer's responsibility to keep the king from being poisoned by his enemies. Artaxerxes had seen that his own father had been murdered by a trusted servant. So how much do you think he cared about knowing Nehemiah was trustworthy, right? He knew all too well the possibility of betrayal from within his inner circle. Like a master strategist, God had been working behind the scenes, putting all of the pieces and all of the players into position. And now the curtain was about to go up, signaling the beginning of a divinely scripted and perfectly cast play. Of course, that's easy for me to say because I've read the rest of the story, but Nehemiah didn't. For all he knew, God had forgotten him and forgotten his people. So I want you to sit with that for just a minute. That's powerful. And I love, and, and you guys have heard me say it, I love the part of the song Waymaker, where it says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working because you never stop working, right? And I love that because Nehemiah probably had thought God's forgotten about us. We've been exiled and we've got no part of his plan. And yet God is just about to show up in some crazy ways. And Nehemiah is going to be his partner. It's an amazing part of the story that we don't want to miss because that changes things for us. Now, I want to just tell you, I've seen miracles in my life. I genuinely believe it. I can tell you of at least three or four or five miracles that I've seen that I've just like flat out. I believe they were miracles. But having said that, we don't always see the miracles like the sun standing still or the parting of the Red Sea or anything like that. But here's what I would say. The work of God continues and when miracles begin to show up, that's wonderful. But that can't be what we wait on to make everything go. 
we have to roll our sleeves up and say, God's work is going to go forward. And then when God adds his miracles, that's even, even, even better. But we don't sit around waiting for God to part the Red Sea every single time. We have to go forward in faith with the vision and the heart and the decisions that he has made or he has given us that we have made in our hearts. It's very, very important. Um, so I just want to share those things with you. I've got one more quote from Andy Stanley that kind of really brings this home. And you know what? I'm just going to jump forward and talk about it right now so you don't misunderstand. In most situations, it's more appropriate to pay for opportunities than for a miracle. More than likely, you need an opportunity rather than something supernatural. Here, look at this. If you're a parent, you probably have a vision for your children. Instead of simply praying that they would become men and women of character, pray for opportunities to build character in their lives. Your vision involves you. You have a role to play. You have a part to play. If you have a vision for unbelieving friends, don't simply pray that they'll be saved. Pray for an opportunity to speak to them about Christ. And then if you pray for that opportunity, more than likely you're going to recognize it when God actually brings it along. And then you're the partner with God accomplishing his work. And so again, over and over, you're going to see this. And I'm just going to pan down. He's a kingdom builder and a visionary, not because of a miracle, but because of his priorities that he's made room for God in his life. That's important. Um, all right. Got a little off, got that going, but any questions, thoughts, or comments that you have? Anyone? Okay. The finishing kick here. Let's do this. All right. Leadership lessons. We've talked about that. So here's what we know real quickly. A God-given calling rises and falls on our why. Let me explain something. A God-given calling rises and falls on our why. Nehemiah is a heroic figure of the faith. But let me ask you a question. Didn't he just build walls? I mean, what's so special about that? Let me just ask you this. Is it special to fill bags full of sand? I mean, that's about as ordinary a job as you could ever possibly get, right? I mean, there's nothing heroic or important about that unless your why of filling those bags of sand is for something like this, right? <laughs> I mean, you're either filling bags of sand or you're building a levee and a dam that will save the, the city from flooding, right? Changes everything. The only thing that changed is the why. Why are you doing what you're doing? So here's what I would share with you. Your why, why you do what you do is so incredibly important and it changes everything. And Nehemiah is just a wall builder, except for he's doing it for God and for God's glory to give people a homeland to come back to, to get the exiles to come back to God's city in Jerusalem. A big deal, a big deal. But really, he's just a wall builder unless you factor in the powerful, multiplying, changing factor of why. So here's what I say to you and to me. Let's make sure that we know what our why is and let's be all in on doing God's will and God's work because it's important, even when it's mundane, if that makes sense. Secondly, a God-given calling does not require immediate action. He sits down and prays and fasts for at least about four months. He does not run off the next day and say, I've just heard about something and you've got to do something about it right now. Mm -hmm. It's for the time to be right. He waits for the list that he knows what he needs. He considers, he calculates, he figures he contemplates, he prays, he fasts. He is ready when the time comes, but not a moment before God opens that door. So many of us feel God is moving in us. So off we go all the way on 
all gas, no brakes. And yet then we ran into a wall because we just haven't thought through, haven't prayed through, haven't considered, haven't let something marinate and mature in us to do what God wants instead of the things that we feel all in a rush and a bother to do. Nehemiah is patient. Nehemiah is calculating, but he does God's work because of it. It's powerful. And then thirdly, a God-given calling requires us to seek God's leading diligently and consistently. He prays and fasts for four months before the time comes and God opens that door. But when he does, it's clearly got God's fingerprints all over it. And that's powerful. All right, questions, thoughts, or comments before we wrap it up with the big, with the big takeaway. I'm open to hearing what you have to say. Um, or if something's really spoken to you, I'd love to hear it. Anyone? I don't want to just end with me talking all of this time. So I'm going to grab a drink. This is your invitation. Anyone got any observation or thought on what's been said, shared, or what you learned? Anyone? You know, I've always heard of cupbearers, but I just never knew. I didn't know that uh, Artaxerxes' father had been killed by a servant. Yeah. It's yeah. like, well, yeah. Um, he was probably a little more diligent when it came to choosing the cupbearer, right? Uh, I would be, that's for sure. Uh, no doubt. Good stuff. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thoughts, comments, questions? I think that's really comforting. It's It relieves a lot of stress, like on our decisions, yeah. you know, many times as we're going through life, like, is this what God wants me to do? And we're all stressed out about it. Well, it doesn't require immediate action. You can chill out for a minute and pray about it and wait for God to answer and wait for his leading. And that that's very comforting to know and to remember. Yeah. Like it relieves a lot of stress. Absolutely. I agree. And I will just say, Eric, real quickly, as I'm kind of bringing this all to a close, one of the things that I have learned is it's if it's a burden from God and if it's what he wants me to do and I want to do his will, then it's not going to go away. But if it bothers me real bad and then a week or two later, I've forgotten all about it. It may have been a, a moment that I needed to be praying for something, but it's not my burden to carry. Now, if a week or two later, it's still on my heart and I can't shake it and it still makes me weep and cry, then that's a burden from the Lord that I need to be picking up and need to be praying about, and need to be working towards, right? But I don't have to do it all today. You know, right. doesn't have to all be done. And I think that's important. Um, if you wonder what's a burden and what's just made you upset or disappointed you or whatever, if it's still there a week or so later, two weeks later, might be considering that it might be a burden from the Lord. That's good. Wow. Man, you just read my mail, Randy. <laughs> All glory to the Lord on that, man. I mean, I'm just a dude in a in a hotel room, man. I'm, I'm barely I'm barely on the internet tonight. All right, here we go. <laughs> Seriously, thank you, bro. Though that means a lot because I, I always want this to be something that touches you guys where you are and where you live. Your optional mm -hmm. reading for next week is Nehemiah 2. The story gets even better and uh, and even more richness from what we've laid. We've done a lot of laying of the groundwork, and even next week we're going to really see some things bloom and blossom, and the lessons are just going to keep on coming. So here's today's big takeaway. When Nehemiah hears a terrible situation in Jerusalem, his heart breaks. But not able to stop at heartbreak, he instead accepts a burden or you can call it a calling, and re recognizes that it's from God. Rather than hoping or only praying that someone else will take action, Nehemiah decides he will take the leadership role in a rebuilding project in Jerusalem. And this is important, a city he's likely never visited, much less lived in. But he is burdened, and he can't get it off his heart. It's a calling from God, and he's going to do it all not so he can be remembered in the scriptures, but that God and his people might be glorified and that his name might be honored. 
and he takes on all of that and everything else comes along to boot. So that's our big takeaway. And uh, like I say, lesson one down, uh, seven lessons total. And uh, we'll be going through, and I believe that you will learn from Nehemiah, learn to be a better leader in whatever context God has you, but just so much there for you. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great. Uh, my very first, uh, one of my very first lessons and teachings is from Nehemiah chapter four. So be here. Maybe I'll tell you uh, one of my second, maybe my second sermon I ever preached. Uh, so anyway, all right. Well, guys, God bless you. I look forward to seeing you guys on Sunday. I hope you all have a good evening this evening and good rest of the week. And I'm looking forward to seeing y'all on Sunday. Okay. All right. God bless you guys. Good night. Thank you.